Welcome to another Moshcraft tier list. This time we're gonna do the blue faction. The, the wholesome faction of the northern realms of the Lilies of Tiberia. The faction of Roche, Fultest. The faction of Onager and... <laughs> Priestess and Melitoli and... You know, wholesome duelers and alumni and the mages and the winches. <laughs> what do you mean, Mr. Henrik? I recorded that footage myself. During one of my subathons, we had a session where chat was like able to build a deck, and uh, that's from my camera. What are we cooking? We're cooking in a tier list. So. We have some categories. Okay. Let's start with the strategy. It's pretty annoying sometimes, like, especially when combined with, like, like, uh, duelers or, like, with a, with a dandelion or something that you just really want to, like, deny inspired on. Or if you're a faction that can't deal with a shielded unit. Um, but let's let's get this one out of the way. Hold on. Where are you at? Standing at the top, all by itself, released at four provisions, by the way, is the Onager. The Onager, better well, better known as the Machine Gun of Temeria. Uh, reportedly, um, the movie Death Note was... Not Death Note. Uh, what's that Tarantino, Tarantino movie where the dude's like leg is a machine gun? That was inspired by the Onager. <laughs> the Tyromancy quest. Yes, Norfolk. Tyromancy. There you go. <laughs> There's gonna be a tier T for Tyromancy. Planetara, yes. Death Proof and Planetara. Planetara was, uh, Quentin Tarantino was inspired to create that movie after traveling to the future and seeing the Onager released at four provisions. <laughs> uh. And then, of course, there's our favorite artifact. The card that will not die no matter how many times it gets nerfed. <laughs> Hope, hopefully it keeps getting nerfed. It's the Temple of Melitoli. Holy crap, I hate that card. Uh, not only does it... So, if you don't know, if you've been living under a rock, or you just, like, after a year of, of you know, sanity, peace, love, and happiness, you were like, hey, I remember what it was like to feel pain and mental anguish, and you decided to pick up Gwent again, and you want to see, like, what some of the new cards do... You may have come across the Temple of Militali Congregation. This is a card. It's an artifact. You play it. You put it on the board. And do you know what it does? It lets you create three legendaries that are not in your deck. So, you don't need to put... Um, let's go to legendary here. Faction Northern Elves. You don't need to put Drog in your deck. You don't need to put Hensolt or Kimbolt or, or War Elephant or Varaxis. You know... Or Roche Merciless, or or Siggy Siggy Dijkstra, or Boholt, or Gerhard. Like, why pay provisions? Why pay 13, 12, or 11 provisions for these cards each when you can just play Temple and get three of them for the price of 12? <sighs> Sorry, 13 now. But that's not all. If you call now, you can also draw a unit of your choice from your deck and boost it by 9. Because that's what you do. You play Temple and then you click it. So, what does that mean? Well, you draw Enseus. And you boost that Enseus by 9. And so now your Enseus is 14 power. Basically, this card, even without creating the 3 legendaries, plays for extra 18 points. And it hand fixes. So you got a brick in your hand? No problem. Put it back in the deck. Draw that Enseus. <laughs> How is that really a card? Yes, it is. 
It really is a card. <laughs> the fuck is going on with this game since I've got? <laughs> and that's just the first form. So if you play it in round one or like round two after losing round one, that's what it does. And, and it has resilience. That's right. So you play it round one. You don't have to click it in round one. You can float it and then click it in round two when you have 10 cards in your hand or nine cards in your hand. <laughs> and, and wait for it. There's more. For a limited time, this card comes with an unlimited protection plan. That's right. This Temple of Militili is actually immune. So you can play it and create yourself a Gerhardt, a Varaxis, and an Erlin in your deck. And then your opponent can't heat wave it. Why would they heat wave it when you already got those cards? Well, because of the click. The click is worth 18 points. But they can't heat wave it because it's immune. Why is it immune, you may ask? Why is it is a resilience location that creates three legendaries immune? Well, the answer is simple. It's the only logical thing they could do. Because if they didn't make it immune, then you would just play uh, Doom Viandra. <coughs> <laughs> this lovely talented card that uh, apparently makes sheep float in the air for some reason. Like, what is wrong with this girl? Like, the sheep are doing their own thing. They're walking around eating grass. And, and she's like, yo, I know. I'm going to rip your like your hair off or your, your fur off of, of your skin and make it float around you while your mother watches in the background. Who does that? Imagine if I came up to your kid and started pulling chunks of hair off of her head and then making him full with this like green beamy thing. Wouldn't you be horrified? Who does this? Why do you exist? Why do you need to re refresh the order of an allied location or a scenario? Really? Like, was that really necessary? Was that something? <laughs> like, and why does she have a cape? Is she a superhero? Is this Brie Larson? Is it Captain Marvel descending upon the, as part of the conjunction of the spheres has been sucked in? But, but why is she messing with sheep fur? Like, I, I don't under, wool or whatever. I, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure I saw a little face on one of these. Doesn't that one look like it has a face on it? It's like half the face of it. Like, it's like a ghost. Ghost sheep or it's like a sheep dog or something that got ripped apart by the fabric of this green goo of awesomeness I don't even so rather than Some of you may remember this card has been problematic with care troll It's been problematic in the past with mushy truffle. It's been problematic in the past with broken burger uh, what's Broken Burger? We'll get to that. It, it, it's the other uh, NR location that summons a unit. But like, <laughs> rather than rather than just say, you know, how about we rework Glim? No. Oh yeah, Tirnalia. Right. Remember when Tirnalia was released? And uh, <laughs> they had to add a random ass devotion tag to Tirnalia because people were using Dwims to get like 70 turns of frost on, on the opponent's row because they just kept repeating the order. Basically, no location could ever have a good order because if it did, then you just play a million Dwims. Because you can play a Dwim, you can play another Dwim, and if you're Northern Realms, you can reinforcement that Dwim, right? Uh, or I guess if you're NG, you could Taurus that Dwim and replay it if you got the Dwim from Vigo, but that wasn't very common. You can teleport the Dwim, you can decoy the Dwim. Like, you just find as many ways as possible of, of, of playing the Dwim over and over again. Whether it's like... You, you you play uh, operators for Doom Viandra and Red Sword one, so that next round you can play one from Red Sword. It doesn't matter, okay? Or you could remedy Doom, you could copy Doom from the... The point is, that card, this little, like, sheep abuser girl, has been a problem with, like, half the locations in the game. And, like, setting aside the fact that when they went to create Temple, like... Like, your first instinct when, when you're creating a thing and someone's like, yo, that would be abusable with Dwim. You should be like, wait a second, what have I done? Why did I create and design a location that uh, that encourages Dwim abuse? Maybe the order is just a stupid thing. Like, maybe we shouldn't... Like, if it's worth playing a 5 provision card over and over again, 
to have used the, the second half of a location, maybe the second half of the location is busted. Maybe we should just fix that so that like people won't be trying to play six Dwims in one game, right? Dwim was fine in meditating mages. Oh yeah. Wait. Are we talking about Bug Temple when it came out? What was bugged about Temple when it came out? Is this game in maintenance mode? I stopped playing after they announced that. Uh, no, they're just not adding new cards. Uh, only these. Only yeah, you should. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Oh, for, for, for the first four hours after Temple came out, it actually worked with Dwibs. So, so they didn't get the, uh, the immunity, right? Probably because like it was the first location that was immune, right? Sorry, I need something a little quieter for this part. Yeah, so <laughs> when Dooms first came out, <laughs> when Temple first came out, they really didn't work. But uh, yeah, anyway, so you're so so <laughs> so you know you, you're you you're, you're proposing a card and and you know <laughs> like putting immunity on this is like is like putting a chainsaw on a baby crib and then saying let's put a plastic guard in front of the chainsaw blade to protect the children no just don't put the chainsaw on the crib okay the crib doesn't need a chainsaw northern realms did not need something that draws a card and puts another card back in their deck and boosts the card that it drew by nine fucking points okay this is the faction with istrid this is the faction with griffin witcher mentors this is the faction with uh Kerserin, which can hand boost the card in the deck by four points this is the faction that has pincer fucking maneuver which lets you literally draw any card any northern realms card from your deck into your hand this is the faction that has so many <clears throat> ways to draw a card it has rafard's vengeance it has siege supports it has like good thinning with dumb matter and it has amphibious assault which boosts a card by the amount of provisions below 10 the uh, nine or whatever the, like so you can play a bronze and also have it be nine power instead of two like it's so silly why did they need like just don't just don't put a chainsaw in the crib <laughs> oh sorry that's the wrong link you can read yep <laughs> Just Google Go Infinity. Yeah. <laughs> so, that was the first form of temple. Second form. When in hand or deck, evolve after you win around. So the second form also has doomed immunity and resilience. Um, and what it does is it shuffles an allied unit back into your deck. So let's say you have a rat of it on the board and your opponent has like a Philippe, okay? Um, and your rat of it's six and his Philippe is five, whatever. You select them both and it puts both rat of it and Philippe back in each opponent's deck. But then you have an order next turn, you can click it and you can replay the route of it. But their Philippe is gone, it's in their deck. And if that card, if the card that you put back in the bonus leg was a doomed card, like let's say a Dagon or like, you know, a tier or something, then that card's gone forever, right? They can't even tutor it back out because it's gone. So the second form of Temple basically says you can just remove one of the opponent's units as long as you have something of equal or higher power on your side, but then you get your card back. And if that card had a deploy, you get to replay it. Because, because the order, it says play. It doesn't say summon. It says play. So, like, people were using it in, in militarily to get, like... So, norm, you, you start out with, with like, uh, three pincer charges. You play a of it that goes to five. Then you can decoy the rat of it and play it again, because you have pincer, right? And that goes to seven, and then you, you can... You can then use uh, Temple to put it back in the deck, and now, now you've got nine leader charges. Because, like, yeah, because you can. 
Or like your opponent played uh, an important engine that you can't answer, no problem, just stick it back in their deck. It, it's it's so silly. <laughs> it's like it's like uh, Beauclair levels of silly, but uh, you know that's not even counting the first form. So this was in probably my least favorite expansion uh, card drop in Gwen's history, which is when they released like Torres and Tear and Dagon and Temple of Melitali and Melitali, like all those cards. Fuck all of them. They were all so bad for the game. I can't even. Uh, Syndicate got what? Gregory? And Siggy Mastermind, I think? Right? Ugh. It was like a leader card drop. And the year before that, they released like uh, Hensolt and, and Milva Sharpshooter and like Dana and Saskia. I, I don't know. It's just all of those. Like, just all of those cards that they were like, oh, these are like important cards in the lore. We should make them super strong. They just, they broke the game and it took months and months to, to, to get, to fix it. Um, pardon me. I need to go for another second again. And we're back. Okay. Why is it immune? Because they didn't want Dwim Viander to be able to refresh the order. Which would have been a huge problem. So I, I give him that. Or I give Shinmiri or whoever pointed it out to them credit. We're not letting it go live with that, but. <laughs> yeah, rather than just being like, you know what, Dwim keeps breaking the game, maybe we should just rework the ability. They're like. Why don't we just make it immune? That's a simple fix. You know. Classic. <sighs> what a card. Okay, back to our tier list. <laughs> so that's Temple. Because provisions are so... Oh, I forgot to say. So when Temple first came out, you didn't know what legendaries your opponent got from it. So you're playing a game, and a opponent plays Temple turn one, and you don't know if they if they got a Varaxis. You don't know if they have a Philippo or a Gerhardt. I think for like six months or so, you had no idea what cards they created. So when you were playing against a Pinsir deck, you basically were playing against the entire Northern Realms legendary arsenal. Because at any point, any of those cards could come out. Like, you'd be playing Kiki Queen or something, and then suddenly a random Philippa emerges. Or Falibor, because Falibor was 3-2-1 uh, for a while and was actually getting played from Temple. So, just, just silly, silly stuff. All right. Um, let's talk about Drog. So Drog is... There you go. Drog is probably balanced. It's just it's hard to say because nobody plays Drog. Um, like you could argue he deserves a buff because he sees almost no play. So maybe like at 8 power Drog would be good. Or at 12 provisions. I don't know. It's just hard because like people were getting it from Temple anyway. And for, his, for, for a long time like NR was in this place where you couldn't buff any of the legendaries by power. Because... Because then, like, you're buffing Temple, right? It, it, it's so silly. This is like this card is probably the one of the worst designs in the history of Gwent. It's just so bad. Like, there were games where I counted that it played for the equivalent of like 50 extra provisions. It's insane. Like, 
average deck has, like your uh, Gwent deck has 165 provisions usually. Somebody played Temple, like they got an extra 35. You know, it, it, it's just stupid. Like they would just get a random hand salt or <clears throat> a random Baron that would end up playing for a million points. Like you can just create win cons. Baron's a win con, you know. Because you would like bleed out there and say us, but then, and you'd be like, okay, I guess we're like, I'm good. I guess my Regis can live or whatever. And, and you gluttony it. And then they just pull out a Baron and be like, nope, just kidding. <laughs> uh, then we have Damavant. This is another really problematic card. There's going to be a lot of those, especially at the top end of Northern Realms. Uh... So what Demovan does is he's 13 provisions. I think he was released at 12, right, guys? <laughs> this was released at, at the same provisions as Lilith's Omen. That is all. That is all. Play a bit. <laughs> so, uh, it has 7 power. And it was initially released as, as cooldown 3. Um, but when you play it, it banishes up to th uh, 3 cards from your deck. And then has an order that lets you play a base copy of one of those cards. So you could play this when it f first came out and banish 2 winches from your deck. Uh, and then maybe like a, a temple. And you'd play this, you'd give it zeal. And then you'd click it, because same turn that you played it. You'd winch it, then you'd winch it again, and then you'd play Temple. So, it would come down <coughs> 7, you zeal it, that's 9, right? And then plus 10 from winches, so 19. And a Temple. Basically an Oniromancy that was playing for 19 points and 2 extra thinning. It was cooldown 3. It was cooldown 2? No way. Uh, I'm, I'm going to check. 1.1. One. Oh my god. Okay, so it was 13 provisions from the start, but it had a cooldown 2, and then it got changed to cooldown 4. Holy shit. I didn't even know that. I mean, when you winch, winch reduces cooldown by 3, so like 2 or 3 was the same in that use case. But if you didn't have winch, yeah. So like every 2 turns, it was like another card, another card, another card. Basically, it was like three Oniraman season one. Just, just like. I'm just saying, like, those are some powerful drugs that those that those guys were partying with when they came up with this idea. Because th that is, like, that's just an insane concept, is it not? Sounds insane to me. Sam, <laughs> very, very be quiet. Yeah. <sighs> what a card. Nowadays, uh, at cooldown four, it's you can still use it to like play Priscilla and Winch and a third card. So you can like bleed out everything and and make them play their scenario, make them play their Enseus, blah 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 blah. Still, short round three, they just play. Demovan into Priscilla, into Winch, into a third card, and they played four cards in one turn. Ah! <laughs> it's just not okay. This is not okay.
Ugh. Hensolt? Hensolt is like... Annoyingly strong. And that's fine, like... Um, because he's 13 provisions and starts at 3 power, but... Like, if, like... It's also, I mean, it's it's still it's still bad design because like with Hensel, like there'd be you, you're never playing it just to be like, okay, I'm gonna put this card between, I'm gonna use it to tutor an engine and then put it between two cards that are have cooldowns and there's like synergy and now opponent has to deal with, you know, decide what to deal with. No, what would happen is you would drop Hensel, tutor Foltest Prod with it, and use all five leader charges all in the same turn and play for 60 points. End of story. So basically, opponent not, not only had to bleed out your siege scenario, but they had to bleed out your Hansel, or they lost. In in a lot of cases, and it got power crept because other things came out that were, were stronger. But like, <laughs> oh, it's just another like, oh, so many either play for like five points or play for fifty points cards that got added to the game, because it, to me that's like emblematic of a single player mindset when it comes to card design like all these cards are like great if you're playing against the ai right you're like oh yeah i, I got my hand sold or if you're playing like Thronebreaker or or rogue mage or something or you're playing went in the witcher 3 where it's like just you and there's nobody on the other side getting slapped around by big fat hand sold. but when you're playing it in a multiplayer game against other human beings who have feelings hopes and dreams <laughs> It just does not feel good. You know? Then we have Militility. You know what? Stupid points, stupid design. <laughs> there you go. I wish I could make this like not do a line break there, but <laughs> so here <laughs> militarily, this is another complicated card. Ignore the deploy for now. This is a card that you want, like, in your in your in your deck. Like you want to shuffle this between your hand and your deck repeatedly. Okay, so ignore the deploy for a second. It says whenever this unit is moved back into your deck. So either from the board or from your hand, but almost always it's from your hand. Trigger an ability from the cycle. So there are three cycles. There's the maiden cycle, the mother cycle, and the crone cycle. The names don't matter. All you need to know is that every time this goes into your deck, it goes down this list. So the first time, it will boost all allied units by zero, as if it does nothing. But it goes to the next step. Spawns a random four provision Northern Elm unit on a random row where you control a unit. So the first time you put it in your, you, you shuffle it into your deck, nothing happens. The second time you get a four P card on a random row. Sometimes that's amazing, right? Sometimes that's like a bricked card because it went on the wrong row and you can't use it. And then the next time you shuffle it into your deck, uh, it says Chrome. Boost self by one, then increase ability values by one. What does that mean? It means instead of three power, go to four power. And then this Maiden would become boost all allied units by one. And the spawn would become a five provision spawn. And also the deploy would go from boost an allied unit by five to boost an allied unit by six. Well, how do you keep shuffling it back into your deck? Obviously one way is mulligans, right? Like you draw the card, you mulligan it. But NR has a lot of cards that basically shuffle a card back into the deck. So you have cards like uh, Istrid that can draw cards and then the uh, shuffle card back in the deck. You have Griffin Witcher Mentors. And then you have cards like Adalia, which let you play another Griffin Witcher Mentor. Or you, ha um, you have locations that can create a, a Griffin Witcher Mentor. Or you have reinforcements or teleports. Um, you also have neutral cards like Snowdrop, right? That the people were using to shuffle cards into the deck. Uh, stratagems like Curse Scroll can shuffle a card into the deck. Uh, what else? There's also like Traveling Merchant and some other stuff. 
uh, that can shuffle cards back into the deck. But basically, the, the, the way most people were doing the shuffle, like, was just playing lots and lots of Griffin Witcher Mentors. And at, at one point, this card got buffed uh, to, to uh, draw two units and boost them by two or something. And it was five power. It was a dark time, okay? It just... <laughs> basically, your opponent would have, like, nothing you could interact with on the board other than, like, Griffin Witcher Mentors that had already done their job. And... Uh, they would play one and it would like draw two and shuffle two cards. And because Griffin Witcher Mentor says draw your top unit mm. or your top two units, people were making decks with a lot of specials. And so basically Griffin Witcher Mentor was guaranteed to draw Militarily. So every single time they played one, Militarily was drawn and shuffled back into the deck. So in one game, you could trigger it like eight or nine times. On top of that, you had Pincer Maneuver, the leader, which had three charges. And you got two more from out of it. So, like, basically, if you could be ahead 40 points against a military player, and they had one card left, and, and a snowdrop on the board, they could beat you by an extra 60 points in that one turn. Like, it is insane how much, like, just by using four leader charges, because every time they do that, it would spawn a volunteer on the board, uh, and then boost everything. And then the next time it would spawn, like, a 6P unit on the board, and, and 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 then the next time it would it would increase all the numbers and then it would boost everything on the board by an extra you know five or whatever it, it just like you could get 300 points with this in the long round <clears throat> you've never seen military before uh, maybe I, I'll play some uh, a game of Militarily for you um, after we're done with the tier list. But yeah, like... And then the worst part about it is that it's uninteractive. Except uh, if you were against Nilfgaard, they would just Vilgefortz it out or Treyhern it out. You know? And so there was a bit of a mind game of like, when do you Vilgefortz and whatnot. Uh, so yeah, stupid point, stupid design is definitely a military description. Kimbolt is annoyingly strong. <sighs> yeah. So, <laughs> let's talk about Kimbolt. Uh, and our cards are so complicated. So, this is a 13 provision card with 6 power. Um... You you play it and it boosts three bronze units in your deck by one each, right? So whatever. Uh, and, and then it has a passive, which is active as soon as you play it. It says the first time an allied unit uses its order each turn, summon a random unit with the same power from your deck to this row. What does that mean? So let's say you have a reinforced ballista on the board. It's at four power. And in the deck, you have another reinforced ballista that's also at four power, okay? Because it got buffed by Beauty Generator or something, or by by Kimbolt on deploy. You you drop Kimbolt, you click the ballista, a second ballista pops out of the deck. Next turn, you you click either of those two ballistas, another four power bronze pops out of the deck. So basically, it it summons a bronze from your deck each turn. If it lives. Um, and, you know, as long as. So it's a bit tricky because you have to have cards with exact power in the deck to, to what you have on the board, but you have a lot of tools to, to manipulate that as an R. Uh, the, the bigger problem is that it's 13 provisions. And so, like, you drop this and then you click something. Usually this would get answered, but even if it got answered, like, six power, one thinning. Uh, another engine on the board. Plus, because they had to answer this, the engines that you summon didn't get answered. It's like on par with Hensel, right? Um, but it like, has a ridiculous ceiling. Uh, it, it became even more problematic because sometimes you will get this from Temple. So you didn't know to play around it. You didn't know to save an answer for it. Uh, nowadays, at least Temple shows you that they got one from it. But yeah.
Shemesh says, the big problem, in my opinion, is that the meta doesn't allow cards that need to, the turns to get value. Yeah, I would I would say, this is what I, how I describe it. There are a lot of cards in Gwent, uh, mostly cards that, have, that were added later on in Gwent's life, that have a ridiculous ceiling. And that has made it so that, like, nobody, you can't play a deck that doesn't have answers for cards like that. Oh, I'm sorry. It doesn't summon just bronze. It summons any unit. My bad. Yeah, so you can summon an and say it's with this. No problem. <laughs> it's not limited to bronze. Why did I think it would be limited to bronzes? Because I thought they would have some semblance of sanity. No. Like, it's it's like there was a point where I guess people felt NR didn't have enough consistency. And then somehow CDPR just like went full monkey bananas on consistency for NR. And nowadays NR decks like thin to zero regularly. It's it's so it's so weird. Anyway, to, to, to what we were talking about, as far as uh, the better doesn't allow cards that require turns, it, it's less that. Like, lots of four provision engines get to live, you know? It's more that, like, a card like this that's getting, like, six or seven or eight points per turn plus one thinning, like, you can't let it live. So any deck that can't answer cards like that just gets, just gets deleted, you know, from the deck builder, and you don't ever play it again. Uh, we even had, you know, we had things like cultists around in the meta. Like, I would have decks that were, like, good, and I'd run into either Harmony or cultists, and then I would just delete them. I was like, I don't ever want to feel this way again. I don't ever want to have a Dana on the opponent's side that's, like, giving him six carry over a turn, and I I, I can't do anything about it. I, I just don't ever want to be in that situation. It is terrible. So, like... Would Kimbolt be played more if it was a 7 power? Probably. Should it be? No, of course not. Like. Like, the only reason, like, Drog isn't the can't be deserves a buff category is because I'm assuming Onager will get nerfed to 6p. Uh, maybe even 7 one day. <laughs> they could delete this card from the game and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sad. Um. Because without Onager, Drog isn't that bad. And Drog is like an old school design thing where it's like, it, it gives you a reasonable amount of stuff. Like, it's powerful. It can convert a whole row of stuff into Revenants. Each Revenant can do one damage. Each Revenant, if it gets a Death Blow, can someone create another Revenant. There's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with that. Um, and then you can put all the Revenants back in your deck and buff them by Erlen. Like, I don't know. Like, people did lots of cool things with Drog. But it was just kind of a fair card with some reasonable worker like uh, counterplay, and the the more recent cards are just not like that. You just drop this, give it zeal, and play four cards. Easy. <laughs> uh, Boholt. Uh, Yeah, <sighs> is it balanced? We're trying to rate cards on their strength, right? The thing is, like, I don't think Kimbolt is balanced. I think it's got, like, a ridiculous ceiling, a uh, super low floor. Same with Boholt. So, what is Boholt? Um... He's 12 provision card. Where is he? There he is. Two power. But he has formation, which means that if you play it on melee row, you get zeal. And he has an order that says spawn a base copy of an allied bronze soldier on its row. So not on the row of Boholt, but on the row of the unit you're copying. So you have like reavers on the melee row. You drop Boholt in range. You click the reaver and you get a new reaver. Uh, or you have an arbalest. You drop Boholt. You click the arbalest. Yeah, you know, sorry, you use Bolt on the Arbalest, you get a new Arbalest. You might think, that sounds like Adalia with extra steps. Well, he also has a passive that says, whenever you spawn a soldier, boost self by two. So, this was mainly used with Reavers, because every turn you would get a new Reaver, because Itaran Reaver interaction is busted. 
uh, or more than one reaver. And every time he did, this just got points. And so, like, they would copy a reaver scout or a reaver, and, like, you didn't know if you should answer the scout or the reaver or this guy, right? And so he would often get a lot of points, but he's also expensive. Um... It's more like answer or lose. <laughs> yeah, that's a better name for this. <laughs> Category? It's answer or lose. Hensult is answer or lose. I mean, kind of. You can't even answer it. It's really like answer slash bleed or lose. <laughs> right? Yeah, if you don't believe that Hensel, you probably lose. At least Hensel requires leader charges, so it's like you can bleed out the Hensel or you can bleed out the leader charges. Either way. Then there's like Erland. Which didn't used to be a problem. But when they added Muta Generator. Where's Muta Generator? So, Meter Generator was released during, this. I think, the same expansion that Golden Necker came out. And this it's the definition of a provisions equal social construct uh, design. Because uh, right now it's eight provisions, but this came out at six provisions, okay? Did Bohold work in a Sintrian deck? Yeah, absolutely. It's just that it's 12 provisions, and it's like a win more card, Pomfret. So, nobody plays it. Uh, most Sintrian decks uh, will will rather use those provisions for a card like um, Temple or like Temple or Temavent, or they would use those provisions for like for Roche and play Golden Necker. So Muta Generator, this is a card that when it came out, everybody thought it was going to be terrible. Now, get, keep in mind, when this came out, it was the same time that Arendite came out, and, and Arendite used to be a 9-provision card, and Golden Necker had just come out. And so the name of the game, the meta, was all about tempo, tempo, tempo. Like, whoever got ahead stayed ahead, because Arendite was, like, a, a ridiculous advantage, right? Uh, and this was a zero-tempo card. However, um, you know, there was one faction that didn't, rely on Golden Necker, and that was Syndicate, and uh, Devotion, or, you know, Devotion Midring Syndicate was pretty good, and it basically farmed Siege uh, because Junior, right, could remove any three power card, and Meter Generator was initially utilized to counter the Syndicate, so what people would do is, like, they would buff their 5P engines, uh, five provision engines so that they would be outside the range of junior and then siege, siege engines could survive and they could defeat syndicate um and then over time people like uh you know when when temple got added uh temple was able to cover up the the tempo deficiency of mutagen so like it used to be you'd play muta generator and uh if opponent like didn't answer it or you know they could just pass because you had such little tempo and you could never catch up. Like they would play three high tempo cards. Meanwhile, you played Muta Generator and like two bronzes and they're just way ahead of you. Well, what Temple did is Temple is basically like 28 points on demand. So people could play Temple and then Muta Generator and then Rune Mage, uh, you know, and and if, if, if you ever tried to tempo pass them, they would just play Anseus and catch up Sometimes they'd have to go down a card, but that's still fine because what they got instead was a, a bunch of stuff in their deck buff. Either four provision cards or five provision cards or ten provision cards all all, all buffed, and that was carryover. Well, what Erland was utilized for was to actually turn all the carryover that was in the deck into points on the board. And because Erland has immunity, uh, when you play it at uh, Adrenaline 4, I, I believe. Where is he? Erland, Erland. 
The room three, also get immunity. So as long as you had four cards in your deck when you dropped this, you got, he got immunity. Then the only way to answer him was basically uh, COC or Igni. There were lots of like games where I went down a bunch of cards, dropped an Erland pass, and opponent could never catch up because they were like Devotion Syndicate or something. Uh, so Temple, Muta, and Erland became like a, a unholy trinity of NR uh, provision carryover abuse. Uh, and and uh, I think Puzzle initially like created a deck and they got refined a little bit and eventually Shoop got added to it. And th hence the Shoop Erlen Mutagen deck was born. Where the, the standard line of play was if you had Rune Mage, play Rune Mage first and then play Temple so you can get like five choices for each, each legendary. If not, you you know you just play Temple. You'd use you'd click it to draw Anseus, and then you play Mutagen, and then you play a bunch of 10p and 4p cards and get a lot of carryover. Later on, when uh, Iris's Companions got reworked into becoming another carryover card, that got folded into the mix as well. But long story short, uh, Ireland became kind of a binary win con that either the opponent could answer or they couldn't, and if they couldn't. Uh, they either needed to uh, win round one quickly so they could have a long round three and outpoint the Erlen with their engines, or they had to bleed out your Erlen in round two. Uh, and, you know, and if they could answer it, then they needed to secure last say because nobody was going to click their Erlen until the very last turn. So it became, it created a lot of these binary situations where it felt a bit frustrating to play against. Um, God, there's so much more to go into. Next card is Kiramets. Uh, cheesy. Get yeah. <laughs> uh, Kira, Kira Mets. Used to be kind of a fun card. Um, if you haven't played Gwent in a while, you might remember um, that she would give vitality to, to adjacent units, right? Uh, she used to give, like, you would put it next to, like, two five power cards, and she would give each of them five vitality. But let's go down back in time to the very beginning. So initially, Kiramets was a 10 provision card, 2 power, deploy range, play a spell from your deck. So she was like, you know, Wisp Distribute or whatever. She was a tutor for a spell, right? That's kind of cool. Um, and then I guess in 2.0, it was just the wording changed, like put in parentheses. Uh, in 3.1, she got changed to the Vitality version. So she was 10 provisions. And seven power gave Odysseus vitality for a duration equal to each of their base powers. So you put it next to Tremerian Infantry, you would give it four vitality. You put it next to like Rafar's Vengeance, you would give it five vitality, right? Uh, I can't tell what changed in 3.2. Oh, she got changed to five power. I guess she was too strong at seven power. Um, and then it got buffed to nine provisions in 5.1, which is in 2020. Uh, and then she stayed at nine provisions for a while. Uh, she got zeal order rather than deploy. She got changed to zeal order. I'm not really sure why this was the change, but I guess it gave her some more flexibility. But I vaguely remember that that didn't do much to get her played. Um, then she got another power buff to six. Still didn't get played. And then it got reworked. In Ju July or June of 2023, to be a 12 provision card with patience, and the the dreaded bracket numbers. Those of you who remember alumni know how scary this bracket notation is. Play X unique bronze spells from your graveyard and give it slash them doomed. Basically, you would play this, and if your opponent didn't answer it, you could play one bronze spell. If they didn't answer it, if you left it, let it live for two turns, and you could play two unique bronze spells. Three, four, whatever. And in a, an alumni deck or, or a mages deck, like 
that's a, a ridiculous amount of points. Like, remember, Gerhard plays one card, one spell, and Gerhard's like super strong. But th this is like. Uh, I don't know. Binary design can't be saved. <laughs> you know, like. Like. I, I miss the old Kira. It was a wholesome card. Maybe it was a little boring because it was points in vitality and required a certain round length to get good value. But, like, I Gwent could use more cards like that. It, it's just... This this card will either play for 6 or play for, like, 20. And that's insane. It shouldn't be like that. Also, it's, like, way worse than Rafards. Uh, not Rafards. Gerhard. Because Gerhard has 11 provisions, 7 power, and plays 1 spell. Initial... It has zeal, so you can just drop him and play a four provision spell. Or wait one turn and get artifact compression. Or wait two turns or get reinfor uh, reinforcement. It's not a spell. But like Stamble Fards or some other six provision spell like uh, Rune Word. I don't know. It This is just like... If you're against an opponent who can't control this, then it gets a ton of value. Hey, the Dango. Then we have Ada. Oh my god. I, I, I don't know, even know where to put this. So this is one of the new cards that NR got. Princess Ada. Deploy. If you have if it's a devotion that gains immunity. Otherwise it's just a five power card for twelve points. Like Five for twelve. Without immunity, it's like a joke of a card, uh, because there aren't a lot of ways that I know of, other than maybe drag, like a, a drag that you float to get value from this to turn that it's played. So it's more like a you just play it and hope opponent doesn't have an answer. <laughs> if they don't have an answer, then every time a curse unit appears uh, on your side of the board, she boosts herself. By the power of that first unit. By, by the base power. So if you play Drog, this goes up to 12. Like You play this and then you drop Drog, this goes up to 12. If you have Revenants on the board and you drop this and you click a Revenant, then she goes to 9. 9, that's, nine for 12 is not good, right? But it's a start. Like it's a decent floor-ish, kind of. <laughs> and, then, and then if she's not answered. Like the problem with this card is that... Even when it works, it goes really tall. And immunity doesn't save you from Igni or, or uh, COC. So it's like, this has to land. This has to live. Uh, it has to get value from other cursed cards, because of the combo card. And your opponent has to not have an answer to a, to a tall immune unit. Yeah, there's some like strong synergies, like Boshling. Um... You know, Revenants, and I guess you can play a Maxi, and she boosts. To me, like, I've just never enjoyed cards that are like, oh, every time you play a tag, do this. Or boost self by the number of tag. Or tag, tag, tag. Like, I want cards to be good together because they're good together. Not because they've been ordained to be good together by some artificial tag. Opponent needs to give you Tome for strength value. Yeah, just play a Devotion deck and hope they play Tome into you. So that you can then, what, AA, a Revenant? <laughs> it's just silly. Now, there's a cheesy thing you can do with this, which is you play Regis, Regis Bloodlust, which got reworked to be a 20 power card for some reason. And uh, then you, you, you play Regis round one, you then play a Cursed Knight, transform the Regis into a 20 base power Bronze, and then in round three or two or whatever, you play Princess Ada, not immune, right? You just float it, hope it lives, or put it behind Defender and hope it lives. And then you Necromancy a Regis, and Ada will boost by 20, and you also get a 20 point bronze for a 7p Necromancy. Sure. Yes. If you do all that because your opponent was AFK or the AI, great. You got like 40 points in one turn. But 
You know, that's never happening. Mon says, tag is a tribal thing. I think it gives a thematic uh, pace or it gives a theme to a deck and I think it's super cool. Right, Mon. Just to clarify, I'm not saying I don't like decks that have all the same cards. I love making a deck that's only vampires or whatever. I just want those cards to work together intrinsically, right? I don't want it to be like, oh, if the cards have a blue background, then boost each other. But I want it to be like, this vampire bleeds. That vampire removes a bleed and boosts self. This vampire boosts self if there's bleeding on the enemy side. This vampire boosts itself by one every time there's bleeding at the end of your turn on the enemy side. Like, this vampire boosts by the number of bleeding enemy units, or this vampire damages an enemy unit by the amount of bleeds that you've applied this round. Like, like rather than, you know, boost self by the number of vampires you've played this game. Like, that to me is kind of annoying. Like, kind of simplistic and not interesting. Right? So it's not that I don't want, like, cohesive thematic decks. I just don't want it to be only because that word exists on the card. I want it to be based on the way they work. Like, if cards are supposed to have synergy, then give them actual synergy, not fake synergy that just says, you know, boost an ally unit by a number of nature cards in your starting deck. Oh, I hate that so much. Does that, does that make more sense? So then we have Vernon Roche, Merciless. I think this card is balanced. Maybe you could get even a buff. Ah, Siggy Dijkstra. Stupid points, stupid design. Siggy is a card that whenever something else boosts it in deck, that boost is doubled. Sure, Mahan, but like, if, if they wanted to, to, to make the curse archetype more interesting, um, they could have done things like Whenever you play a, a, a cursed unit, uh, damage it by half its power, and then damage an enemy unit by twice the amount. Right? Like, we're cursed. Like, something bad happens to me, something bad happens to you, or something. Then, it, then this wouldn't go tall, and it wouldn't be like, oh, do they have COC? No, I guess I lose. Like, they could have even kept the, the, the devotion immunity, but the fact that this goes tall is what makes it a bad design for me. Like, if, if you can't do something properly, then don't do it. Y you know, another way to, to make cursed cards better is just to buff the cursed cards. Right? Like, if you want Anna to be better, then make her six base power. Ta-da! Vincent could have been like four base power, five base power. I don't know. Matt Keen could be six provisions. There's also no rhyme or reason to why some things are cursed. Like this guy could have a shield or two armor or something, so it has a chance of living. So, I don't know. Veraxis. Uh, uh. I don't even know what to do with Veraxis. And I think uh, I'm not feeling super inspired at the moment for the rest of this. It's like a long way to go. So we're going to call it here. Um, End of part one for the NR tier list. We'll do the rest uh, next stream.
There are a lot of NR cards, and I have a lot to say about each of them. But honestly, like, NR is probably the hardest to save faction for me. But in general, I would say the older the card, the better it is design-wise. <laughs> That's sad, but I think kind of true. <laughs> like, this is such a stupid card. Oh my god. Like, this is a good card. Yay. Right? Okay, fine. Fine. 